Okay, microphone check one, two. Good morning, guys. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And um, we're going to cover two chapters in the lecture today and then Wednesday. <clears throat> Uh, Wednesday will be a lab day where we'll do, instead of the three separate labs I originally had written out here, I'm going to have an integrated lab here for the uh, DHCP and network address translation function. So the subject for this week is something we generally lump together is something called IP addressing services. But first of all, I want to share... The administration has asked us to remind all the students to uh, uh, evaluate your classes in WebAdvisor. Or I think it's easy to do it from my TCC Blackboard. So uh, within here, for example, here's what you see for within our class. If you just go, let's see, mouse action here. Okay. If you go here and you click Course Evaluation on the left-hand portion where I get my, you know, my printouts and so forth, just click on that, and that'll take you to a tab where you can evaluate. I'm actually a student. It won't work for me. But you guys, when you click on that, it'll bring up a little. This is a confidential evaluation <clears throat> where uh, nobody can see what you said specifically. And the instructors will get only a sort of an aggregate type of uh, compilation of all the results uh, at the end of the semester, but only after all the final exams have been completed. So uh, uh, don't have to worry about if you say anything you don't like my choice of bath soap or something like that, and I'm going to give you a worse grade because of that. It's totally anonymous, and no one will be able to see that. So that's the one evaluation that we ask you to take here, just because, you know, the college is like to, uh, TCC likes to collect statistics for all this stuff. Um, nothing terrible will happen if you don't do it, but we'd like you to do it if you could possibly schedule five minutes and do that sometime before the end of the semester. Uh, there is one other evaluation that uh, Cisco Networking Academy, the website, the Canvas website and Cisco Networking Academy does have a business rule. And before you take that final examination, uh, they require you to take their course feedback form, which is another customer satisfaction survey, another student uh, satisfaction survey. And then you'll be able to take that, that final exam. So today I'm going to cover, I'm going to show you the um, PowerPoint slideshow I'm going to use. <clears throat> And it's the one that says uh, Chapter 8 and 9, Consolidated, DHCP and NAT slides. There's some separate chapter ones that are official ones, but I like to use this one because I like the graphics on it that are better. And then when we do the, uh, on Wednesday when we do the lab, Wednesday we'll get together and I'll show you how to drag everything into the packet tracer scenario and I'll show you what that lab is. It's the, um, uh, it's the one that says 7.4.1, Integrated. And I've also got some configuration on the one below it <coughs> that will show you how to use the RIP configurations because technically we haven't covered OSPF yet. We've only covered RIP. And this lab was written back in the days when we were supposed to know OSPF first. So nothing confusing about that. I'll talk more about that to, uh, Wednesday. Okay, so let's see. I need to stop sharing this and see if I can share this PowerPoint slideshow. Okay, so let's say good recording. Um, IP addressing services is this term that we talk about in networking for the things that, uh, for example, the DHCP function, it assigns IP addresses to workstations on a dynamic basis. Uh, it'll assign an appropriate IP address to oh, client workstations and things of that nature. Uh, so you don't have to go out and, uh, as network technicians and network engineers, we don't have to go out and statically assign IP addresses and then reassign them when somebody moves to a, a different location or reassign everybody's static addresses because the, uh, the company changed ISPs. And the other function is uh, network address translation because normally inside your home network, you're that 192.168.1 type address, but that address, those, those uh, private inside addresses are not allowed to exist on the internet. When we talked about access control list last time, we had a slide that said, oh, if I encounter any packet that has a source address of 192.168.1.1, I'm just going to drop it. So we use the NAT function to change your inside private address that's not allowed to be on the Internet 
to a valid IP address, probably one of the single address you got for your ISP. Or if you're a small business, you might have like six addresses. But if you're a really big organization like Tarrant County College, you have a bank of addresses that you can assign to your inside devices. So they have some protection against the outside world and, and you'll have connectivity. Okay, so let's start with dynamic host configuration protocol, and I'll tell you a story here about why I love this so much. Because I was worked, I was I'm an old network boy, and when I first started working with networking, there was no such thing as DHCP. There was a predecessor protocol that I didn't use because it was hard to use, and so in those days we statically configured everything. So when some person was promoted from one department to the corner office in another department, and they're on a different floor of the building. I would have to go and manually change their IP addresses on their desktop PC or their Macintosh machine to be an appropriate address for that new network. And I had to maintain a bunch of Excel spreadsheets with valid IP addresses and cross them out and add them back in when I'd taken them from one machine and added to another machine. It was a big hassle. It took a lot of time. So when the DHCP came out in about the mid-90s, uh, all us network administrators have eagerly adopted this because it relieved us of a lot of drudgery of having to go around and reassign IP addresses to workstations. Now, when I worked at the 90s at this publishing firm in downtown Fort Worth, uh, it was mostly Macintoshes. And so the thing about Macintosh users is usually they're, they're working advanced publishing, you know, like Photoshop and Quark Express and things of that nature, and they're usually fairly sophisticated computer users. So my joke is that Macintosh users already know everything there is to know about computers. So when they move their computer to a new office on a new floor and it should get another IP address, they just go in there and put in whatever they want to. Well, they haven't taken fundamentals of networking, so they always put in something that was not only, it was so bad it wasn't even wrong. And it would mess up their computer and maybe mess up the whole floor. So when the DHCP function came out in the mid-90s, I put this on our servers. Uh, I'm really dating myself. We were running Novell Netware, which is a legacy product that no one should be using anymore. <clears throat> and this is how this works. Uh, our mnemonic, uh, a mnemonic is a, a word that you use to remember something. You know, like, for example, all people seem to need data processing is our shorthand for, for uh, application presentation, sessionation, the layers of the seven-layer OSI model. So the mnemonic for, for the DHCP function is DORA, D-O-R-A, DORA the Explorer. Those of you guys who got kids that watch that, that, that Channel 13 stuff. So discover, offer, request, and acknowledge is the four-way process here by which a workstation that has that button checked that says obtain the IP address automatically in tech techno speak that means be a DHCP client and ask a server for your address so at home your home router is a DHCP server here at Tarrant County College we have a specialized dedicated server to the DHCP function maybe in a small medium-sized business you might have a Microsoft server Microsoft server 2016 or Microsoft server 2019 and you're make, gonna make that server be the DNS server and the DHCP server for this and maybe file and print sharing for the company. So we'll look in detail about how about that works in a later slide. So everybody needs an IP address. Everything, not just your employee desktop PCs or your student PCs uh, or your home PCs at work, everything else needs an IP address. So you got a Roku that needs an IP address. You got a PlayStation that needs an IP address. So normally we assign dynamic addresses through DACP to um, desktop PCs and things of that nature. Some devices we have traditionally assigned a static IP address to because they're not going to change and something like a router or a switch that's expected to last 10 years or more that's locked away in a closet, we're going to give those things static addresses because we don't want them to change. They're a, like, for example, the router is the default gateway address for all the workstations. That's not an address you don't want to change frequently. You don't want to change it at all. Other devices, it really doesn't matter what address they get, so long as it's an appropriate address and they can communicate with the Internet and communicate with the other people in their company. So desktop PCs, employee PCs, they don't care what address they get. They don't know anything about IP addressing. They just say, I can't get on the Internet. They want to be able to connect to the Internet and connect to, you know, uh, do their stuff that their job uh, description requires them to do. 
So workstation, desktop, employee PCs, they can use any particular address within that range of addresses that you planned out when you set up the company, so typically within some IP subnet. So at home, you're probably 192.168.1.0 base network, and probably 1.1 is probably your home router, Linksys top router address. And the uh, all the other devices can be any address. Typically what these home routers do is they'll reserve the range from one to 100 for static addresses, and then they'll start giving out, maybe your first PC will be 192.168.1.100 or 101, and that's over 150 available addresses for your devices you probably don't have, but more than one or two dozen. So this is a great aid so that untechnically sophisticated people don't have to worry about static IP addressing and type in all those numbers and I'm gonna make a mistake, so it does it automatically for them. So uh, that top, that graphic at the top, that's a graphic for a, a server, some type of server. The graphic at the bottom is the graphic for the router. So if it's not a small office, home office type situation, a residential situation, or a small branch office, we won't have a dedicated server at that location. Maybe we want the router to do that. So at your a small office or home environment where you have a cable modem and a home router, uh, he's going to do that DHCP function for you. He's going to assign addresses to uh, all your individual devices. In a larger business, like uh, Tarrant County College has got 100,000 students and 4,000 employees. So we're not going to use a Cisco router to do that for us because Cisco routers are so expensive that uh, we don't want to waste the CPU cycle capability and then just for a mundane task like assigning IP addresses. Instead, we're going to get a cheap Intel box to do that. We'll use an existing Intel server like a Server 20. 16 or Microsoft Windows Server 2019 box to do that. Or we'll use a specialized DHCP box that hooks right into Active Directory domain services and, and uh, uh, enforces the security in the company. Okay, three methods of DHCP operation. The manual method is the IP address is pre-allocated by the administrator and DHCP configures the address to the client. This would be like for a server that I want, don't want the address to change. Okay, guys, nobody uses this method. If I have a server, I'm going to go into the server. I'm going to unclick the button that says obtain the IP address automatically. And I'm going to click the button below it that says use this IP address. And I'm going to statically configure the IP address on that server. Or for, uh, in the college, for example, we do it for our servers. We're going to do manual IP addressing on routers and switches. Uh, we do manual IP addressing for all of our printers as well. Uh, they they tend to the last a long time. That printer in the classroom is, is 10 or 15 years old. So it's not going to change. We want that printer to always be the same address. We're going to statically configure it. Uh, desktop PCs, they get replaced every three or four years. They're a good candidate for dynamic, just a silent automatic IP address. Maybe the motherboard goes out on a Dell PC and they replace the motherboard. So now it's got a different MAC address in it and it'll dynamically be assigned a new IP address that's okay within that range of IP addresses for our classroom. Uh, automatic is DHCP automatically assigns a permanent IP address to a client with no lease period, so nobody uses that either. We're gonna either going to click the box that says obtain the IP address automatically, like if it's a desktop PC, and it'll get a dynamic address, or we're not going to use DHCP at all for printers for servers, for clients, uh, for, for not clients, for switches and for routers. We're going to statically configure those when we go into the iOS of this switch or the router or when we go into the uh, little uh, configuration program that's on the printer, we're going to statically configure those. So, but let's look at how DHCP would work in the case of the majority of our machines are going to be employee desktop PCs or student machines in an educational environment or at home, all your devices that you use at home, they're always set to obtain the IP address automatically. So all your all your Wi-Fi attached devices like laptops and tablets and telephones and Roku and Fire Sticks and, and Game Boys and all these other things that need IP addresses, they're going to ask for an IP address from the server, and your home router is going to deliver it to them. In a commercial environment, in a business environment, in an industrial environment, we're going to have a dedicated DHCP server to do this job. Uh, we're uh, it's, it's just too much processing power for a cheap Linksys router. We're going to have separate devices do this stuff. We're going to have several servers. So we'll configure one of our Microsoft servers to be a DHCP server. And we're going to configure all our employees' desktop PCs 
to out of the box, that box is checked by default. It says I want to obtain my IP address uh, automatically. So this is a client server type of a transaction. So clients request services and servers fulfill these services. So I will use the file server to store a file like a word processing file for my boss's report. I will store it on the server, the file server, and then he can pick it up because it's a shared file that he's got permissions to. In the DHCP function, a desktop employee PC is a client machine because he's got that box checked that says obtain the IP address automatically. And he's going to, every time he boots up, every time he turns on, he wants to go out and get an IP address to use. Take a few seconds to go through this transaction process, get in touch with the server, and get an IP address to use. In the case of Microsoft, they try to use the same IP address that they used yesterday. So when a client machine connects, the server will assign the IP address to the device. We call this a lease, and you can lease it for a predetermined amount of time. Typical times are one week, two weeks, three weeks. A uh, lease can be reduced to a small amount of time. Like, for example, if you're going to change from one ISP to the other ISP and you had to change all your IP addresses, a trick is reduce the lease time to like one hour and then do it over the weekend, change your ISP connection. And when everybody comes in on Monday morning, they automatically have the new IP address and they don't notice any problem. So just like when you lease an apartment, so you lease an apartment for 12 months, um, uh, about 11, 10 or 11 months into your lease, you're probably going to contact your landlord and say, I'd like to keep the apartment for another year. I want to extend my lease. Let's sign a lease agreement for another year. So when a DHCP server leases an address to a client machine, the client machine will, when uh, most of the lease has been used up, he'll contact the DHCP server again and see if he can extend it this lease period. Now, if you leave your apartment, it's available for someone else to rent instead of you. If a machine is, uh, old machine gets replaced, it's turned off, or the employee is no longer there anymore, the lease would never be extended. And that IP address that was being assigned to that device that's no longer being used is returned to the list of all those available IP addresses and some other device can use it in the future. Okay, let's look at these four steps and a little bit about the broadcast function. And we'll talk about later about the problem with broadcast and how we can overcome that if the DACB server is not in the same broadcast domain, like plugged in the same switch. Well, look at this graphic. We have a, we have a, uh, a Cisco Ethernet switch, and we have a client desktop PC, and we have the server that's being configured as a DACB server. Could be a Linux server, could be a Microsoft server, 2019 server, that's been configured to be the DACB server. And the client machine, when he boots up, he doesn't have an IP address yet. Oh, yeah, it's a Microsoft computer. He wants to use the same one he used yesterday, but he's not allowed to unless it's being reauthorized by the DHCP server. So all he knows is his MAC address. He has a physical burn-in MAC address on his network interface, Ethernet adapter that's on the motherboard of the computer, and he's not allowed to use any IP addresses yet. He's not allowed to create an IP packet and send it to that server and request an IP address to use because it's a chicken and the egg type of thing. He hasn't got that IP address yet. So he has to send out a uh, Ethernet frame, a data link layer frame, and he's going to, of course, put his MAC address as a source address, his unique MAC address on his client machine, and he doesn't know the IP address of the DHCP server. It could have been changed over the weekend. They may have upgraded it. So it has to be sent out in the form of a broadcast. The DHCP discover message is the client machine attempting to discover all the DHCP servers that are present in that uh, environment. Now, at home, it's only going to be your home links of stack router. In a business environment, uh, for redundancy reasons, for fault tolerance reasons, uh, Microsoft, for example, recommends that you configure at least two DHCP servers. So if the Microsoft server crashes, with, which they're famous for doing all the time, Microsoft servers aren't stable, they crash all the time. We'll have another one that can give you a server if the first one's not working right now. So you send out this broadcast message. Okay, the broadcast frame flows out of the client onto the right of the graphic, and he flows into the Ethernet switch in the middle of the graphic. And what are Ethernet switches compelled to do whenever they hear a broadcast? Think about that for one second while I check attendance. I'm still here. I'm just checking attendance. Oh, hold, 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 hang loose one second. I'll be done in just a second here.
times 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Okay, I think we're cool here. Okay, so. Sorry, Austin makes me do this kind of stuff. So what happens when any type of broadcast frame, whether it's an ARP request or, or uh, in this case, a DHCP request, flows into a switch, the switch is simply compelled to, to flood that broadcast out all the other ports. Because normally switches are very efficient. They have memorized MAC addresses, and they only send the Ethernet frame you sent into your port that goes that you're plugged into out the port that the destination machine you're talking to, like you're trying to ping. Well, if they haven't learned that MAC address yet, they have to flood it, unknown unicast. But a broadcast frame is a special type of frame where the destination MAC address is not a unique, valid, individual MAC address of a workstation. It's all once. It's all FFFF. So switches can't learn that. They can't learn the broadcast address. Anytime a switch receives an Ethernet frame and it's the broadcast destination address, he simply floods it out all the ports that are up and up. So our server is plugged into one of those ports, and he hears the broadcast. And all workstations that hear broadcasts are compelled to, uh, their Ethernet adapter is compelled to decode the Ethernet frame and open it up and pull out whatever is embedded in the payload portion and the data portion of that Ethernet frame and send it up to the operating system of that computer for him to figure out what to do. So everybody else in this company heard this DHCP broadcast frame and all the other devices except our DHCP server, other employees' PCs, for example, they, had to, they were compelled to receive this broadcast frame and they were compelled to open it up and pull out the data portion and send it up to the operating system. And all the other desktop PC says, I am a DHCP server. I can stop processing this point and go back to my database or whatever I was doing. But our DHCP server in this case is a DHCP server. He recognizes the port number, port 67 and 68 for DHCP. He responds to that and he begins to process the frame. So that's step one. Our client machines sends out a broadcast request, the DHCP discovered broadcast request. Okay, so it's received by a DHCP server. Uh, there may be two DHCP servers. It is possible in an industrial, uh, in, uh, in a commercial environment for the client machine to receive two offers. Uh, Microsoft machines will always try to use the same offering they used last time. So the DHCP server has responded to this uh, uh, request. Now notice when the DHCP server sends it back, it is not in the form of a broadcast. It doesn't have to be anymore because when the client machine on the right sent out his request, he had to send it in the broadcast because he didn't know anybody's MAC addresses except his own. Well, once the DHCP server received this request, he knows his own MAC address and he now knows your client MAC address, so it's sent back as a unicast. It is not a broadcast. Oh, there's another broadcast coming from you again, but not from him. So he sends back the unicast, and it, it contains an offer of an address to use, but you can't quite use it yet. This is a four-step process. This is kind of like TCP. We have SYNC, SYNC, ACK, ACK, and then at the end, we have FAN, ACK, FAN, ACK, four steps. This is a four-step process. So the client machine looks over this offer. Uh, this step is necessary because what if he'd received an offer from two different DHCP servers that have been set up by the company for fault tolerance reasons, for, for uh, redundancy reasons? He would choose the one. He has to choose one and accept it. In this case, there's only one. So the client machine looks over that and says, I've looked over your offer, and I'm going to accept it. Again, sit in the form of a broadcast because he hasn't been finally authorized to use any IP addresses yet. He has to still do it in the form of a broadcast. So if there were more than two, more than one server, it would be the server that he chose. He would receive that offer, and the others would have to ignore it. This function is also used for lease renewal and verification purposes. Okay, finally we come to the last step, which is the client machine has chosen the individual DHCP server. In this case of this graphic, there's only one, and the server has now says, okay. You told me you wanted to use my offer. Here is a, a verification. Here's your IP address. Here's your subnet mask. Here's your default gateway. We're going to give you this lease for three days in this particular case. Your DNS server address, use that. Uh, oh, uh, for DNS server, um, it's going to be set up by the ISP or within the company, or you can use one of the publicly available DNS server addresses. Now, some of you guys may have heard about the Google DNS, the 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. Um, that's a real easy number to remember. 
Uh, and if you don't like your ISPs, DNS server, some of the cable companies are famous for hijacking DNS. And if you mistype the name of a server, they send you targeted advertising. Well, do you think Google's going to do anything different? Google's tracking you like a dog, man. So if you use the Google server, 8.8.8.8, he's tracking what web places you're going to. And he, next time you go to Google, you're going to get targeted advertising from Google. So if you want to avoid any of that nonsense and not have to put up with any of the of your cable company's nonsense on the cable company's built-in DNS server, uh, use one of the uh, other project ones. I like what's called the Quad 9, 9.9.9.9. That's a free DNS server you can set your workstation to. By the way, you can go into your Windows workstation and leave the top click to obtain the address automatically because you have to for your home router to deliver a valid address to you. But you can go to the bottom of the screen and you can change the just the DNS part to either get the DNS. By default, it'll be obtained the DNS automatically from your cable company. You can change that. You can put in a static DNS address. If you put 9.9.9.9 in there from the Quad 9 project, this is a I, this is a DNS server that it's a whitelist, blacklist thing. You know, there's a lot of bad web places that you shouldn't go to on the internet. Oh, they're in North Korea or they're in the Ukraine or something, and they're going to try to put ransomware on your computer. So if you use 9.9.9.9 as your DNS server, and uh, you, you accidentally try to browse to something that, that's not a good place to go, uh, that's going to help you out on that. So I recommend that, the Quad 9 project, 9.9.9.9. Okay, Mark, rant mode off on DNS. It's not a DNS chapter. Okay, so here we have our steps one, two, three, and four of the client workstations and the broadcast of the discover, discover the server, the server responded. Uh, the client machine chose that server and said, I want to take your offer. And then the final acknowledgement and authorization came from the DACP server and said, use these addresses, and here they are. Now, back in the days before DACP, there was another protocol called, protocol called Boot P. And Boot P used the same port numbers, port 67, 68. But it was intended for diskless workstations. These are PCs that had no hard drive and no floppy disk drive. And you would probably say, well, what, why would you do that? Well, in some places like in the defense industry, in aircraft plants, uh, uh, you don't want disk drives in the computers because someone could put a floppy disk drive and copy a blueprint for a fighter jet and take it home and sell it to the Boris and Natasha. Okay, so we just won't have any disk drives in our computers. And every time the computer boots up, he's going to load the Microsoft operating system over the network server. Okay, that eliminates problems with the desktop computers, and they simply shot hot glue in all the USB ports so you can't plug in a flash drive. Um, this was an early one that it did assign IP addresses to computer workstations, but it was a static thing. You had to, some system administrator had to go through and write down all the MAC addresses of all the devices and type that into a table and then assign a particular IP address to it. It wasn't dynamically done. DHCP is so easy. You just tell them the range of addresses. You don't have to write down any MAC addresses, and it'll automatically assign IP addresses out of the list until it's used up. Boot P was a permanent assignment. Couldn't be changed easily. DSCP is lease. I can lower the lease time if we're changing our internal IP addressing scheme. Boot P only supported the big four numbers. What are our big four IP numbers? The IP address of the workstation, the subnet mask, the default gateway address, and the DNS server address. DHCP supports those four, but lots more besides. So when DHCP came out in the mid-1990s, ninety in the mid -1990s, uh, everybody jumped on it because it was such a wonderful thing. And all us network technicians and engineers have gotten really tired of having to go around and statically configure this stuff all the time. So when you look at this message format, it shows it shows the IP address, the subnet mask, the default gateway, uh, that type of stuff. And they added some functions to the original DHCP, the old boot P function. They added a lot of functions to the DHCP where you can have your, oh, your NetBIOS server, your companies like tccd.net, we have some weird addresses that we use in our internal structure. Okay, let's look about configuring a Cisco router as a DHCP server. Now, if you're doing a Microsoft server, you're going to go into one of these server snap-in panels, and you'll put in the range of IP addresses that you want to uh, send out to. And in the Microsoft Windows Server environment, there's an additional step. You can authorize DHCP servers uh, and, and Active Directory Domain Services, which is their 
list where they keep your name and password. Uh, that way, people can't make up a DICP server and mess up the company. This goes down another method. We'll see that later. So, in the first step, is we're going to define a range of addresses that DHCP should not allocate. So in the case of a home router, most home routers will use the 192.168.1.0 network. Some home routers might use 192.168.100.0 as their network. Uh, and they'll typically reserve the range of the first 100 addresses for the dot one router port, and they'll start allocating 100, 101, 102, and so forth to your actual home devices. So in the Cisco iOS, we need to tell which addresses not to allocate. We'll see the exact command in just a second. Then step two is we're going to use a command called IP DHCP pool and make up a, a name. And that's going to be create our, IH, our pool of addresses and then turn on the DHCP function. And then we can configure specific things like what's the default gateway address? What's the DNS server address? Things of that nature that we need to put in there. Now, the service is running by default. On most Cisco iOS is supported, it's going to be on by default. If I don't want it on for any reason, I can turn it off by no service DHCP. If I want to turn it back on again, I type the command service DHCP, all this from the global configuration mode. So you won't have to do this in your lab. It's already turned on by default. Okay, remember that first step? We need to to exclude the dot one address for the server and the dot two address for the switch and the dot three address for the second switch and the dot 10 address for the first server and the dot 20 address for the second server and stuff like that. So we're gonna go through the global configuration mode and say IP DHCP excluded address. And then in the case of my example, what your home really does, the low address would be 192.168.1.1 and the high address might be 192.168.1.99 or 1.100. Exclude those 100 addresses that we need for our for our static devices. Now we're going to actually configure the pool. We're going to go to the configuration mode and say IP DHCP pool and make up a name. Um, you can, remember when we had our named access control list, and I recommended that you make up a, a name that made some sense for your environment, and always make that name all capital letters. So IP DHCP pool uh, business with the business building at South Campus. You could make up a pool that gave out addresses in the business building. Maybe we should make it SBUS because our business building name is SBUS and put it in all capital letters. And as soon as I press the enter key, the prompt is going to change to this new magical prompt we've never seen before. Config dash DHCP. We're in a sub uh, uh, sub configuration mode of the global configuration mode. And now we're ready to start typing in some commands to configure this individual DHCP server we've just made up. You can have more than one pool. Maybe you have a maybe you have a router that's got two Ethernet ports, and one goes to the bottom floor of the business building in the computer science department, and one goes to the top floor of the business building in the accounting department. And we would create different pools for them. Okay, so now I'm at the contact dash DHCP prompt, and I'm going to type in some additional commands. So this is step three. I need to configure the pool of addresses. So let's say that that uh, uh, address at your home was 192.168.1.0. You would type in the command network 192.168.1.0. And look at this choice we've got now. Oh, I have, when I configured that interface port on that router, I had to type 255.255.255.0. Well, this is one of those few commands that Cisco ILS will allow you to not have to type in all that 255.255.255.0 and type slash 24, which is much easier to type. Why can't we do this on interfaces? Why can't I say I, interface G0, IP address 192.168.11 slash 24? That's much easier to type. Well, you can't do that, but on this you can. So you can specify your network, either the subnet mask, the traditional 255 business, or you can type the slash number like the slash 24. So that command will start the DHCP process running on any router interfaces on that router that are part of that network. So if I configured my Ethernet port to be 192.168.1.1, well, that's a member of the 192.168.1.0 network, and the DHCP function would now be enabled on that particular port. Or any port that comes in existence in the future, doesn't matter. 
And this is also the pool of addresses that the DHCP server will use. Or well, what are our possible addresses for 192.168.1.0? Well, it's an 8-bit host value. 2 to the power of 8 is 256 possible values. Well, there's a couple we can't use. The, the all zeros is reserved for the network address. He's not going to give out a network address to a client machine. All the all ones is the 255. Well, that's the 192.168.1.255 is the reserve broadcast function on that network. He won't use that. And we've already excluded 1 through 100 with our previous statement, excluded the rest statement. So the pool of addresses they will use will be 101, 102, 103, all the way up to 254. You can't use 255. That's reserved for broadcast. So he's got a little bit over 150 addresses that he can hand out. Good appropriate size network for a business environment. We normally don't want more than 50 to 200 devices in one broadcast domain because all the ARC requests and DHCP requests will eat our bandwidth up alive. Okay, so now the workstations are automatically going to be assigned 192.168.1. whatever the next number in the list is, and that slash 24 sub MS, the 255.255.255.0. Now we can assign our default gateway. Well, what was our default gateway? Well, it was 192.168.1.1. It could be different in a business commercial environment. For example, we use the 10 dot addresses. So our default gateway is 10.144.0.1 in our classroom because we're using the class A addresses. They don't have more numbers available. We're a bigger company than a residence. Normally, you just put one, but you can put up to eight. Okay, now let's put in that DNS server address. So within Tarrant County College, we've got a 10 dot something address. We have two DNS servers. Uh, so the DNS server gives all of our classroom computers two DNS servers that are downtown at Trinity River. So at home, you would put in, this would be the address that uh, came from your cable company, or um, you could put in that 9.9.9.9 quad nine project for higher security on your network. Or you could be 8.8.8.8 and let Google track you like a dog. Or you could use your cable company's DNS server and let them track you like a dog. Whatever you want to do is fine. Okay, Windows Server, Windows Internet Name Service. In the old days of Microsoft, Microsoft calls these things down-level clients. Think of Windows 98, uh, Windows XP. These are old. 20-year-old operating systems that a lot of people still use these within their companies. Uh, so think of people that don't want to spend money on new technology. I think of doctors and lawyers. They're so cheap. So if you got some of these old devices, Windows Internet Name Service was a Microsoft proprietary thing that's like DNS. Uh, in the old Windows computers, like Windows 98, you could click on something called the Network Neighborhood, and you would see the other devices at your small company, and you would see the file server, server one, whatever it was called. The WINS service uses this. Now, unlike DNS, which has 250 characters, this is a 15-character name limitation. So for many years, Tarrant County College had a bunch of old machines, so we had a WINS server set up. A Microsoft server has to do this because it's a Microsoft-specific function. Well, that WINS server has an IP address. So this NetBIOS name server would be that address. You probably won't need this in your networking career because everyone is IP only now. Um, now we can assign a domain name uh, like uh, tccd.net or tccd.edu or whatever the name of your company is, cisco.com. You could put this in here. And this is one of the additional functions that DHCP hands out that the old boot P would not do. Now, what is the duration of our lease going to be? By default, one day, 24 hours. But if you want to reduce network traffic where people don't have to get a new address every day when they come in, increase it to a, a good option, I think, is two weeks. Because if you make it two weeks, then uh, machines that stop being used after two weeks, that address will be returned to the pool. Now, if you're your C-suite guys, your chief executive officer guys, well, they go on vacation for three or four weeks. So when they come back and turn on the machine after they've been out of the office for three or four weeks, their lease time will have expired, and they'll get a new address. But to them, they don't care. It doesn't take one second longer, and they'll get an IP address that works. But that way, you can clean up your pool of IP addresses. And if someone, if a position is eliminated, his PC never gets used anymore, that address will be returned to the pool within a few weeks. 
Okay, so there are other available parameters, uh, which we're not going to worry about in this particular one here. Uh, but you can configure like 20 or 30 different things with DHCP. So let's, let's try not to worry about this. Okay, now a DHCP server has a list of available addresses to give out, and he's going to give it out to a workstation. But what if some jack wad crazy guy has configured a static address on his computer? You know, he's taken an A plus class or something, he's configured a static address on a computer, and it conflicts with. It, it's it, it's a within the range that's in within a DHCP pool that's already on the system. Okay, he doesn't know anything about DHCP. He doesn't realize he's doing this. So as a safety measure, whenever the DHCP server wants to give a, an individual IP address from the list he thinks should be a good address that no one is using right now that should be okay to give to this guy, he wants to check to make sure that it hasn't been used yet. So there's two methods we can use to check for this. Uh, he'll try to ping it. The DHCP server is going to give you, maybe he, you turn on your PC in the morning and you, uh, the DHCP server is going to give you 192.168.1.199. And so the DHCP server is going to check to make sure that someone else didn't hijack your 199 address. He's going to try to ping it. If he gets an answer back from his ping, oh no, bad magic. Someone else has already taken that 199 address. He'll try another address for you. So this is just a little insurance technique to make sure that uh, uh, someone else didn't accidentally or, or uh, put, put an IP address on the network that they shouldn't be. And you can change this value with these, uh, these commands. Uh, uh, what's another way that you could check to see if an IP address was present on the network? Because I was trying to ping it. Uh, I'll, give you, I'll give you a chance to think of it. It's five, four, three, two, one. And thank you for playing. We have some nice party gifts for you. Well, you could do an ARP request. You can send out an ARP request for 192.168.1.199, and if you get back a reply, that means there's another workstation on the network that heard your request for the ARP that says, give me my MAC address. So that's two methods you can always check to see if another workstation is present on the network. Pinging is easier from the command prompt, uh, but you can ARP it, and if it responds to the ARP, it's there, you should use it. Okay, so let's look at this particular network. We've got uh, two Ethernet ports coming from this router, R1. And let's say this is like our business machine at South Campus. So the, uh, the zero Ethernet port is going to be the downstairs computer science IT department. And the F01 port is going to be the upstairs accounting and philosophy department. So we want to put a range of excluded addresses. So if you look at those orange statements, you will see that the IP DHCP excluded address for the 10 dot network on the left, we're going to exclude 10.1 through 10.9 for, you know, routers and switches. And we're going to exclude the 10.254 address for the very last address. And for the second port, the F fast Ethernet 0 slash 1 port, we're going to exclude the 11.1 through 11.9 addresses and the 11.254. Now, step two, we're going to create two LAN pools. We're going to create LAN pool one for the dot 10 clients on the bottom floor and LAN pool two for the people up on level two, the accounting department and the philosophy department. And then in the blue lines of code, we're going to specify those addresses, the 10.0 network and the 11.0 network and their default gateway routers. And that will configure all that's needed for those. Now, let's check to see what addresses have been handed out. We can type show IP DHCP binding and that will show us all the addresses that have been assigned to clients. We can type show IP DHCP server statistics and see some, some percentage numbers on about how that server is run. We can type show IP DHCP pool and see the actual pool of addresses for this. Okay, our last command is very dangerous. Debug is very dangerous. The debug command show only shows you a static picture of what's happening right now. Uh, the various debug commands that are on the router will, as things happen, that will put a line on the screen, a printout on your console port, telling you something has happened. So if I debug IP DHCP server events, when I boot up my workstation and it attaches to the router and the S of the router for the IP address, the router will put a line on the screen. The problem with debug is that it consumes a lot of system resources and it reduces the efficiency of the router. So here's our debug best practices. Only turn on debug for a limited amount of time as possible to find out what you need to fix or troubleshoot a problem and then turn it back off again with no debug. Uh, 
uh, debug eats up a lot of processes. So only use it for a limited amount of time. Now, when we do our labs, it doesn't matter. You're not, you know, taking away somebody in the li uh, la library being able to get an IP address. In a production network, if you top on turn on too many debugs, you can actually crash the router. So careful with debug. Now, a problem with DHCP is it uses the broadcast function. The client machine sends out a broadcast. That's great for switches. Switches send the broadcast out to all the other ports. What if the DHCP server is not in your broadcast domain? So looking at this diagram, we have a router R1 and we have two broadcast domains. Actually, I have three technically. We have the two fast Ethernet ports, the two floors of our business building, and then we have a, a line that goes off to the internet service provider or the home office or the rest of the campus or something like that. Three broadcast domains. So when PC1 sends out his broadcast request, it will go through switch S1. It will go into router R1, and but router R1 will not forward or flood the broadcast. Routers don't do that. They filter broadcast. Switches flood broadcast. Routers filter them. So that means the DHCP server, which is up on the second floor, cannot hear the request. Oh, the guys up in the second floor that has to switch S2, they're in great shape. They're going to send out their broadcast request. PC2 sends out his broadcast request. It flows into switch S2. It's flooded out the port connected to the DHCP server, and PC2 gets his address just fine. But what about the poor guy in PC1? So we need a, a method that's going to allow that broadcast request to go to the DHCP server through the router. And the problem is the router ain't going to forward any kind of broadcast. So what are we going to do? Well, here's what happens. We're going to perform a little broadcast surgery. We're going to perform a little rocket surgery, broadcast surgery on that packet. When that Ethernet frame and the broadcast frame leaves the PC and it encounters the router, we're going to put some code on that router that says, take that destination broadcast address and change it to the IP address of the DHCP server. So it's now a unicast packet and not a broadcast packet. And now it will go through the routers, any number of routers that are between there and that DHCP server, and you'll be able to get your address. This is a technique we have to use at South Campus because we don't have the DHCP servers at South Campus. They're downtown at Trinity River. It has to go through several routers to get there. So when you send out your broadcast frame for a desktop PC, when you turn it on, it's converted from a broadcast to a unicast, and now it can reach the DHCP server, and he can send his unicast back to you, and you can get your address. There are several different functions that use this particular scheme. And, and uh, for DHCP, this is called DHCP Relay. We're going to configure a helper address on that router R1's Ethernet port and say F0, FA00 port on R1 whenever you receive a DHCP broadcast, and you'll know because it's port 6768. <laughs> Then could just simply convert that broadcast to unicast so I can decide to survive the rest of the trip to the network and we'll be able to hear it. Hold on, gotcha. Attendance here, I see somebody popped in. Okay, that's cool. There are some other functions that use uh, 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 this, like that bias. TFTP and so forth, uh, terminal access control. Let's just worry about the DHCP function. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go to that router port on the first router that's going to receive host A in this case. It's trying to send out a DHCP request so you can get us 10.113 back from yesterday. So the router A's FA00 port is going to receive this broadcast. And he can't forward broadcasts, but we put a line of code on that fast Ethernet 00 port that says when you encounter a broadcast, like from the DHCP request, convert that to a unicast IP address, and the destination IP address is 172.24.1.9, which is the IP address of that DHCP server back at Trinity River downtown. And then he'll be able to receive it. He'll be able to broadcast, broadcast that stuff. So uh, we're not going to use all those other protocols. It's technically possible to, to disable these. Uh, uh, this is uh, not a part of CCNA anymore. Okay, here's another thing that used to be a part of the CCNA curriculum and was taken out about five or six years ago, something called SDM. And you say, wait a minute, SDM is the switch database manager. I had to go into the switch 
and change the switch database manager to dual IP version 6 so I could put an IPv6 management address on that switch. Well, SDM used to stand for Security Device Manager, and it was a graphical setup utility. And all the marketing guys at Cisco convinced the upper management that we need to put a, a web-based setup utility on all our routers and switches because all the Linksys routers have them, and all the customers want them. That's nonsense. Us Cisco iOS, uh, us Cisco technicians and engineers hate GUIs. We like to use the CLI, the uh, iOS product. So for many years, this was present on Cisco devices, and you had to know a little bit about setting it up. But it's been taken out. You don't have to worry about that. So try to avoid the confusion between the old security device manager, which is similar to the GUI that's in your Linksys router that you would set it up when you uh, configure your home router. We don't use that anymore. Okay, let's troubleshoot DHCP. Uh, if there's any address conflicts, remember that uh, ping test? You check to see if the, another worked station was present on the network with the address he was fixing to give to somebody. If you type show IP address conflicts, that'll show you that. Now you can hunt down and try to find this guy and kill him and knock his machine off the air. Uh, verify physical connectivity. Uh, a good way to ver verify physical connectivity is set your workstation up with an unused static IP address and see if you can ping the server. That proves the wires are plugged in and, and the drivers are proper and so forth. And then switch it back to DHCP and see if you can get it to work. Uh, is your switch port configuration proper? Is it in the right VLAN? Do you have switch security turned on and using too many MAC addresses? Do the DHCP clients that get their IP address, are they on the same subnet or VLAN where the DHCP server resides? If not, broadcasts do not go through routers, and you'll have to configure DHCP relay with the IP helper address. And then there are some uh, DHCP uh, uh, Debugs, again, watch out with debug commands. Don't leave them running all day long. They're going to kill the performance of the router. Okay, good. We're finished with the DHCP part, and now we're going to jump to IP uh, uh, network address translation. So this is your inside computer. Maybe the inside computer at home is 192.168.10.10. In the example, this lower left-hand corner of the graphic. But I can't send that source address packet into the Internet because it's going to be dropped by... The uh, cable company is going to drop that. So what we need to do is and what your home router does, and indeed what we do in business is uh, we change our inside private IP address to an outside address that will survive on the Internet. So in the example, we have this Internet-style address 209.165. That should be a valid Internet address because our inside address is 10.172.16, 192.168. Those are reserved for private use within the company. They have to be translated to a globally unique outside address that's allowed to exist on the Internet because the ISPs are going to filter them if they're not. Okay, so public IP addresses, uh, the various parts of the world have different agencies that, that give these out. So in North America, we've got Aaron. I call them the name and number of 30 people. So if you're a big, super big uh, ISP, you'll get a bank of addresses from them. If you're a big, super big corporation, you'll get a bank of addresses from them. Us ordinary mortal people, we get ours from an ISP. So you cable company people at home, you've got one globally unique, perfectly valid internet address you got from your cable company. You have more than one device, but we're going to see later that uh, that we can use port numbers and share that one address with lots of individual devices. <clears throat> so the inside addresses that we're not allowed to use on the outside internet, because someone could spoof an address, for example, uh, in our classroom at South Campus, we're 10.144. something. Well, why don't I just spoof an IP address and claim to be 10.144 and try to break into the web advisor and change my grades to all A's and issue myself $1,000 tuition refund checks? Well, that won't work because I'm coming from the outside world. And when I hit that ISP service provider address, they're going to drop my packet because it's not an allowed address on the Internet. So this is the range of addresses, Class A addresses starting with 10. Class B addresses starting with 172.16 through 172.31. And Class C addresses starting with 192.168. Perfectly okay to use within your company. So at home, you use the C. You're probably 192.168.1.100 at home. Uh, at Tarrant County College, we use the B range of addresses for our Wi-Fi services. And we use the Class A addresses, 10 dot, for our uh, 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 plugged-in Ethernet devices. So you are not allowed to route private addresses over the Internet. 
they will drop them. The, uh, however, there's not enough public addresses to allow organizations to provide one for every one of their hosts. So we're going to use network address translation. Use a private range of addresses at home, like 192.168. Well, TCC's got 100,000 students and 4,000 employees. So we're using class A address because it's got a lot more addresses. So network address translation is going to translate my inside address to a perfectly legitimate, globally unique internet address to go to the outside world. And then it's going to translate it back when I receive it. So the function of the DHCP server was to assign those 192.168 private inside addresses to devices inside the network. And then the router that connects us to the outside world will use the network address translation function and change my 192.168 address at home to a public address. Like I used to, I think I'm from the Southwestern Bell, uh, AT&T, I'm 199.99.99. something in the outside world, a perfectly valid outside address. So when I send packets out of my network, the NAT function at my home router, I've got one of these built-in integrated routers from the telephone company that's a combination home router and a DSL modem all in one box. He'll translate my 192.168 address into that outside address, 199.99.99, whatever it is. And then when the answer comes back, he'll change it back to my inside address so my computer at home will get to it. So the NAT function on that, on that router, uh, your home router would do that. At Tarrant County College, we have a router that connects us to the public internet, and that does that function. So typically, this is a stub network. At home, you're a stub network. There's only one way in or out through your ISP. Even a big company like Tarrant County College, we have one link to our internet service provider. And that border router that's at the edge of our network that connects to our ISP, that will do the network address translation function. So a host on the inside network wants to access, you know, netacad.com or cisco.com or microsoft.com or Facebook or wherever you need to go on the outside world. And that's going to send to your, your border gateway router at home. That's your Linux type home router or the, some, even the cable company uh, to, uh, has a, either integrated combination home router and cable modem routers, or you might have a separate device. So your home router function will, will do the NAT function and change that inside address to the outside address that's allowed to exist on the internet. And then you'll be able to have communication with the outside world. And there's a little table, a little code table that's present in your home router that keeps track of whenever you go to the outside world, uh, when you make a request, you're a client machine, you make a request of a server, like a web server, it will keep track of the port numbers and the IP addresses. It'll translate the inside address to the outside address. And when the answer comes back, you will match that answer with your request. And that's a sort of a, like a security firewall function of your home router. If someone tries to send bogus answers back to you trying to break into your home network, it can't possibly match up. The IP addresses, the port numbers won't match, and it'll reject it. So we're going to look at the three different types of NAT, dynamic and port address translation. So let's look at some terminology here. Oh, good, we're going to have the bloody eyeball thing. So the inside network is the organization's LAN. At home, it's your home network, your Wi-Fi and your Ethernet-based network. The outside network is typically the internet. Now, from the standpoint of the bloody eyeball within your home network or within your company network, the local address is how the node on the network is seen by another node on the same network. So if your workstation 10.0.0.3, you could ping the other workstation as 10.0.0.2. You see them as the same address as subnet that you're on. Up on the internet at a web farm at, at uh, Cisco, uh, they have a public address of 128.23.3.3. And then you go to the assessment server at 128.23.2.2 and take a chapter test. They're all seen as on that local network that's at the Cisco web farm. So how are you seeing uh, local addresses, how are you seen on the same network, you be inside or outside. Now, a global address is how the node on one network is seen by a node on the other network. Now, you're at your private home network, and you're 10.003, and you see that global network at, uh, you see that network at Cisco, you have that public IP address they have to publish so that you can connect to the Netacad site and take your chapter exams. Same address. However, the internet web server that's responding to your request, he does not see you as 10.0.0.3 because that's not allowed to pass to the internet. It's been natted. It's been changed to some 
globally unique address that's okay, like in my case, 199.99.99. whatever it is. So the inside local address is always going to be that request for comment 1918 address, 10.172.16, 119.168. The inside global address is the address that I see, like if I ping netacad.com, that's the IP address I connected. The outside global address is a reachable IP address assigned to a host on the internet when he talks back to me, not my 192.168 number, but my 199.99 number. An outside local address, that's beyond the scope of CCNA list. Don't worry about that. Okay, so here you are at PC1. You're sending a packet. You want to log into the web server at Cisco and take a test. So you send your packet out, and your source address is 192.168.10.10, and your destination address DA is the address that the DNS has looked up the address of Netacad when you type Netacad, and that's its address. So the packet leaves your PC and flows to, in this case, R2 is the network address translation router. He needs to do the rocket surgery. He needs to change that source address from 192.168, which will not live on the Internet. It will be mercilessly destroyed. He needs to change it to that outside address that you were assigned to from your cable company. So he gets this 209.165 type address. It goes through the Internet. It survives because it's a good Internet type of address. It hits the Cisco web server, and he says, oh, okay, you logged in with your name and password, and here's the web page for Chapter 8 of this course. And he sends it. Now, when you receive it back, that table that was maintained inside your home router, in this case R2, is like your home router would be. When that packet comes back, because that server at the Netacad thought that your address was actually 209.165.200.226 has been changed. So when that packet comes back and it's R2, he's going to do reverse rocket surgery, and he's going to change it back to 192.168.10.10, so it'll go through your little home router for a port switch or Wi-Fi network, and you'll be able to receive that packet properly normally. Okay, let's talk about dynamic mapping and static mapping. In dynamic mapping, we're going to map some local addresses that are not allowed to exist on the internet, these are these blue addresses, to a range of outside addresses. Now, notice that there are eight addresses within the small company, but only six addresses, 81 through 86, that's only six addresses. So with dynamic mapping, whatever address is available in that 81, 86, whichever one's not being used now, the first one that's not being used, you'll get that when you try to connect to the outside world. The problem is there are more inside clients than there are outside connections. And if six guys are already on the Internet and your number, you come on and you try to get a session, you're locked out. You can't get the address. You have to wait. You have to wait for one of them to end their session. Don't worry. We're going to have a workaround for that later on. This would be a big problem for you at home because you only have one address. You're not paying the $200 a month to get the bank of six addresses. You only have one address. So we're going to use a feature that allows uh, um, uh, many inside addresses to share one outside a little bit later. So in static mapping, there's a whenever the workstation 10.0.0.1 goes to the outside world, he's always 179.9.8.81. Now, this is necessary in the world of business. Maybe 10.0.0.1 is the web advisor server, and 10.0.0.2 is the www.tcc.edu public web server, and maybe 10.0.0.3 is the Blackboard, my TCC Blackboard server. They have to map to a specific address that's always the same every time. You can put that in DNS tables of the Internet. So companies normally need, need several static mapping addresses, addresses for their in, internal servers that are reachable from their employees or their customers on the outside world. So this means that there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the dot one, the dot 81, and the dot two and the 82. They can't change. We need these for our internal addresses. Now, most home, home users don't have static mapping. They don't pay for this because they're not running servers from the outside, in the inside world to the outside world. Um, so, for example, my Cisco.24.com website is not run from my home. I pay a web hosting provider you know, seven or eight dollars a month, and he puts it on the server farm and it shows up there. So port address translation solves this problem. Okay, you've got a cable modem service at home. You only have one global unique IP address to the outside world, but you have 
maybe dozens of internal devices, and they all need to be translated. And I only have one IP address. So I'm going to start monkeying around with port numbers. I'm going to use our port numbers, which we use TCP numbers. It's a 16-bit IP. There's 65,000 of them. Well, there's a lot of those numbers that I can use. Um, um, there's 65,000 or so combinations of 16 bits and maybe 4,000 is a more realistic value. So what I'm going to do is, that since I can't use different addresses to the outside world, I only give, was given one by the company, I'm going to use unique port numbers. This is what all desktop PCs do anyway. If you have three web browsers running on your single PC, port numbers are used so that you get the proper response in each web browser that you're running. We're just taking the same exact concept and expanding it from one PC using three different port addresses to three PCs, each using three different port addresses and one IP address to the outside world. This is enough to uniquely identify each connection and everyone gets the data that they want to, wanted. So in this example, and that overload, two machines, one's the 10.11 at the bottom, one's the 10.10 at the left at the top. They use these port numbers, unique port numbers. If they don't happen to make up a unique port number, the, the NAT server will automatically adjust that so they're unique. So when they send their address to the outside world, we have to take that 192.168.10.10 and 11 and change it to that outside address. So in this case, the outside address was 209.165.226 was the only address was given by the cable company. Well, if we mark those with a unique port numbers, 1555, 1331, those are unique port numbers, then they'll be treated separately. Each server will individually get the response back and when the response comes back to your home, your web, uh, your uh, home router will automatically send this back, back to the proper individual workstation. Because Lord knows you don't want to see what your teenagers are going to. So this is the port address translation feature. We're going to add not only modifying the IP address, but adding port numbers as well. When they come back from the outside world, they're translated back to the proper port number and the pr proper individual unique IP address within your home network, and each device receives a proper one. <clears throat> So if you happen, here's the case where the two different machines happen to choose the next same, what we call the ephemeral port number. The, the servers, servers use low port numbers, like port 80 for web. Client machines, they're not allowed to use numbers below 1,000. They're client machines. They have to use client numbers, which are above 1,000. Well, in this case, these two PCs just happen to pick the same port number. So the NAT table in the router will automatically adjust to this and um, change the port numbers slightly so they're unique to the outside world. Okay, some benefits. Conserves our legally registered addressing scheme. We kind of started running out of IP version four addresses in the mid-90s, and this adoption of NET was one of the band-aid things that kept us being able to uh, do this stuff. Uh, flexible communications, connections. We have consistency for internal network addressing schemes. We don't have to change our network addressing on the inside of our network of our company. And it gives us some security. The NET function will only reject Bogus attempts to connect back to us from the outside world from a malicious, you know, malicious intruder or threat actor. There is a downside. All this translation of addresses eats up CPU cycles. It only takes a thousandth of a second, but it does slowly slow down performance slightly. End-to-end -end functionality can be degraded. In some cases, uh, pings or traceability are not possible. Uh, if you're doing tunneling, it becomes more complicated. Uh, TCP can be messed up, and it may have an effect on our, our networking architecture. Okay, the good part. Let's go to the iOS code to do this. Remember our first case was static NAT? I'm simply going to translate the chief executive officer's machine, 10.1.1.2, to a single address. He's always going to use that outside address, 172.23.2.2. Or maybe more typically, that's going to be the web server for the company, www.company.com, and you want people from the outside of the world to get to that web server so they can see and buy our products. So our DNS server from the outside world has associated 179.23.2.2 with, uh, with the URL of mycompany.com. So you put a line on the router that says IP NAT inside source static, and the source address is the inside address, and the uh, 179.2322 is the outside address that is allowed to live on the internet. <clears throat> now, you have to do one more thing. 
you have to tell the router which port is the inside port within the company and which port is the outside port that goes to the outside world. So in this case, the Ethernet port on the left is the inside the company address. And you have to go to that port anyway in the yellow lines and assign it the default gateway address. And then you simply add the command IP NAT inside to tell the NAT function this is the inside, uh, uh, this is the, our, our secure network that we control. And then on that serial port that goes back to your ISP, you assign the IP, ISP address to that serial port that was assigned to you by your internet service provider, and then you mark it with IP NAT outside. That's the outside untrusted network. So in this case, the 10.1.1.2 server, it's a, maybe it's a Linux server running Apache web server. Maybe it's a Microsoft server running Internet Information Services that's running our public web server. We want people on the outside world to come and see about our company. That will always map to that one address. That's what we have to do with WebAdvisor. That's what we have to do with MyTCC Blackboard. That's what we have to do with the public um, uh, you know, www.tccd.edu, our public uh, website that you're going to get general information about the college. So that's a complete configuration for that scenario. Now let's do dynamic and NAT. This is where we have six addresses from the outside world and eight employees within, and whoever got it first got it. Uh, the problem is we had more employees than we had outside addresses. We're going to solve that problem in another slide or two with the uh, uh, NAT overload. So we're going to create this uh, IP NAT pool. Let me go ahead and go to the slide with the actual code on it. I'm going to create an IP NAT pool of addresses. I'm going to call it NAT pool 1. And it's six addresses. Remember that 80 through 86, 81 through 86? Well, now it's 80 through 85. 179.9.8.80 through 85 is six addresses. It ranges six addresses. Subnet mask slash 24. And this is going to be the addresses that will be assigned to guys within the company. The first six, the first six lucky guys will get this address. And if the seventh or eighth people try to get in there, they have to wait for one of these six to finish their session. We have to specify an access list to who gets to go to the outside world. Maybe everybody within the company. Maybe if it was a public school environment, only the kids that are 13 years or older, like the junior high, high school kids, their subnets will be able to go to the outside world. Maybe the kindergarten kids, they don't get to go to the outside world. So we're creating an access list that either gives everybody or restricts that to a certain extent. So in this case, access list one, standard access control list, permit everybody that's 10.1.anything.anything .1 .anything to be translated to the outside world. In this case, everybody in this graphic is allowed. Then we're going to specify the inside and outside stuff from step one to step two and mark the interfaces like we had to move forward. We had to mark the, the Ethernet port, port as the inside trusted network with IP and NAT inside. And we had to mark the port on the outside, our untrusted ISP, IP and NAT outside. So here's the complete code. The first statement in orange creates the NAT pool that range of uh, six addresses from .80 to .85. The next orange line, who is to be permitted to get connections to the outside world? Well, either, you know, the, the high school kids, but not the kindergarten kids, whatever the requirements are at your organization. And then IP NAT inside source list one, pool on that pool, references back to the first orange statement. IP NAT and inside, outside maps a list, and the configuration is complete. It'll start doing it. Now, the problem was we only had six addresses and we had thousands of internal employees that needed to connect to the outside world. Or at home, you only have one public IP address to the outside world, and you have dozens of devices that need to communicate. So we need to monkey with the port addresses at layer four, not just the IP addresses at layer three. So we're going to use NAT overload, sometimes called port address translation, to do this because we have thousands of unique port addresses that we can use to solve this problem. So let's say you're at home and the ISP is giving you one public IP address from your cable company. We're going to sign that IP address as the IP address of the outside interface. That's the wire that goes from your cable modem to your home router, if you haven't got one of those built-in things. Uh, define an access list permitting which addresses are to be translated. Well, all of them probably at home. Then establish dynamic translation, specifying the access list and the interface instead of a pool of addresses, and include the keyword overload and then specify inside outside addresses. 
So it's kind of similar to what we did before. We had an access list to permit all our inside employees. But on that second line, we changed it. We said IPNet inside source list one, interface S010, our connection to our ISP, and put the keyword overload, which means use port numbers to have more possible connections from our inside network than we have IP addresses. We only have one IP address to the outside world. That's assigned by the ISP. That's that 209.165.200.225. That's assigned to our outside port. And then we mark our ports with IPNet inside and IPNet outside. This is what all home routers do, except you don't have to type iOS into them. They do it from a GUI. Now, what if you have more than one public IP address? In this case, we have a pool of from 226 to 240. So we've got like 14 addresses we can use to the outside world. So uh, if we have uh, uh, more than a range of addresses in the business world, medium-sized large businesses would typically have more than one address to the outside world. So they can spread their load out better because you have a limit of about 4,000 connections with one IP address while well, we have 100,000 students. We need more than one address. Now, we can verify this. We can type the show command, show IP NAT translations, and we can see the translations that have taken place from the inside world to the outside world. It shows us the inside address 192.168.11.10 was translated into the outside address of 209.165.200.254, and it was able to survive the trip on the internet. So you can check that. You can type show IP NAT statistics, and it'll show you well, in this case, there was 173 translations that took place, and there was nine misses that didn't take place because they they weren't on the access control list that allowed it. Now, sometimes, and I think they have you do this in the lab, sometimes you need to change how you're doing. You're changing maybe from static to dynamic or overload. You need to clear the translation tables in the router. You don't want to have to erase the whole router and reload to do this. Uh, you're just going to change one or two lines of configuration. So if you type the command clear IP NAT translation and the asterisk or start command, that'll wipe out the NAT table, and then you can change it. Otherwise, you're going to get an error message on the router that says can't clear the table. You've changed your NAT function, and the table still got stuff in it. I can't take your command. So if you get that in your router, they tell you to do it anyway in the lab procedure, but you're going to clear the IP NAT translation table to make that work out properly. Okay, and finally, we're looking at the troubleshooting. Uh, we can do the clear IP NAT translations if we're having a problem. Uh, we can show the IP NAT translations. And then there's our very dangerous debug command, which is perfectly okay to use in a lab because you're not in a real network. Um, he's typed debug IP NAT. And it, as you do stuff from your PCA and your PCB and your PCC and their addresses gets translated, you will dynamically appear on the screen the NAT functions that have taken place. So this is useful for troubleshooting in the real world or for the teaching and learning process in the, in the labs that we do here in the Cisco Network Academy. Okay, so I've covered the chapters eight and nine all in one fell swoop here. Um, so on Wednesday, we will have, it'll be shorter on Wednesday. Sorry, guys, I've taken a long time today. Uh, on Wednesday, I'm going to show you how to set up this, this lab in the packet tracer environment and get started with my, you know, I like to do the show Cisco Discovery Protocol. No fair, we haven't covered that. It's in a later chapter. I like to use it to make sure all the connections are proper. And then this one integrated 7.4.1 lab will be used instead of the alternative of the three separate labs that's in the current topology. Uh, it will be a little bit easier for you guys to do, and there's a minimal amount of questions that need to be answered in that particular lab. It's a PDF file instead of a Microsoft Word document file. Uh, the only gotcha in this lab, and I'll talk about this on Wednesday when we come together, is that it by default uses the OSPF routing protocol. Now, the code is actually in the listings at the back of the lab, but I also have another presentation uh, that will show you uh, the RIP alternative for that. Now, I'll show you that more uh, next time when we, when we come together and have our whole dedicated lab day uh, just for that. Okay, guys, we're getting close to the end of the semester here. Again, please take the opportunity, if it's okay with you, to evaluate all your classes, not just my class. Go to the easy, the easy link is to go to the MyTCC link and click evaluate. 
There's another option when you log on to WebAdvisor and click the student menu. There's a click link you can click on to evaluate your classes. And um, okay, I think I'm about finished now, so I'm going to be in my microphone, stand by a couple of minutes if there's any questions or chat messages, and uh, we'll call it a day for today. Thank you guys for coming. I look forward to seeing you again next time.